In this episode, we cover fixing things like vacuum cleaners, toasters, and editing to make your work stand out above all others. Hello and welcome to Stories from the Red Couch, episode 54. I'm Robin Cook and today my guest is Eric Adelson. You got it. <laughs> How are you, Eric? I'm fine, thank you. Thanks for coming. And it was short notice too, so... It was. Yeah, it didn't give you enough time to really think, oh, will I do it or won't I do it? You know, just barreling well, in. I think what's happened is it's, it's, it's got me in, as you say, short notice, that I don't have time to panic or, or, or right. worry about it too much. Which it slips is, right into your Eric the Ready moniker. Does. I suppose it does. It doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. So how did you come up with that? I mean, it, that's your business name, isn't it? Yes, yes. Tell me about Eric the Ready. Uh, in 1983, I was retrenched where I was working in Johannesburg. And I went out to try and cobble together an income. Mm. And I had to do handyman work because I'm, I'm good at that sort of thing. And I, I was born in Norway. Uh, the beard I've had since 1980 and I thought and I was driving a red microbus and the, the whole thing just gelled as Eric the Red being the old Viking from the 10th or the 8th century and um, the whole thing evolved from there and I created the little logo and, and it's been Eric the Ready ever since and Eric the Ready has been put to bed on a couple of occasions he's been put on the shelf and, and left there. But every so often, there would be a resurgence. I was retrenched two or three times while I was down there. So each time I would dust off Eric the Ready and go out and fix things for people. Sometimes it was two-way radios. Sometimes it was just anything that, that came handy that I felt I could do. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, then that's how the name came about. So how is it that, how important is it, do you think, to fix things? I mean, it, it, is it a good thing to do? People well, tend to throw things away? I started fixing things. My mother was widowed when, in, in 1961. I, I was 14 <laughs> and my brother and sister were babies. And um, after taking us back to South Africa for a short time, we were living in Rhodesia. After taking us back to South Africa for a time, she realized that she probably couldn't cope in the Cape. The weather conditions weren't as good as they were in Rhodesia. So she took us back there and she made a home for us and and, uh, and, and we grew up. But not having much money, um, I, she would say to me, do you think you can fix this? And I would say, I don't know, let's have a look. And so I had a few screwdrivers and a pair of pliers and whatever, and I'd take things apart. And if I couldn't fix it, I'd at least be able to put it back together. <laughs> that, that, that's those a handy thing. Words. <laughs> those were her words. So I started fixing things. I'd fix the toaster and I'd fix the kettle and I'd fix the vacuum cleaner and I'd fix this and I'd fix that. And friends would ask me to fix things. And, and of course, the other thing was that in Rhodesia from 1965, we had sanctions and they were quite, uh, quite, as far as food on the table and that, they weren't really a problem. But as far as technological things were, were concerned, uh, appliances and that sort of thing, you couldn't get them. So you had to fix them. So even if it was made to be thrown away, mm. We didn't. Mm. We found a way to take it to pieces and find out what made it tick and fixed it. Sometimes it was a bubble gum and string fix mm. and sometimes it was a very, very good fix and sometimes it was an improvement on the original. Oh, that's fabulous. So, isn't it? so you learn to become, and then of course I joined the regular army and I was in the Corps of Signals and you learn to be innovative. It's encouraged to be innovative and be creative and um, find solutions to problems. That's um, great, isn't it? So as a young person, mm -hmm. to have the opportunity to pull things apart, put them back together again, and work out ways of, of innovating, mm -hmm. carries you through. So, and, and to then to be encouraged while you're in the army, when I would think mostly we're discouraged from doing things like that nowadays. Do you think we are? No, it's a common misconception about the army that do as you're told and don't do anything else. Um, the SAS is a prime example, I suppose, of, of, of learning to stand on your own two feet and, and do it. But throughout the army, it is very different to the popular concept of um, people square bashing and people firing on the rifle range and, and people just generally being 
the cartoon version of soldiers. There are cooks and engineers and motor mechanics mm -hmm. and electronics experts and radar experts and and people from virtually every interest plumbers bridge builders the whole bit and they're all employed somewhere in in an army ours was a very small army and a lot of our people were, were territorials they, they, they weren't full-time soldiers um, but generally we could get things done we, we, we learned to be innovative and we were encouraged to be innovative we were encouraged to use our initiative to to um, to make decisions and be decisive and not not wait for someone else to tell us what to do um, and I think a lot of modern armies are probably like that these days because the battlefield whether it exists or whether it's going to exist is a very volatile place and you there are going to be times when you're cut off and there's nobody you can turn around to and say what do I do now? Mm, so you're trained, this. You you're have to, trained to use your loaf. Mm. You're trained mm. to, to, to make. I used to say to my guys when I sent them out to do a job, I say, when you're out there and you come up against it, make a decision. Mm. Even if it's a wrong decision, but at least make a decision and go for it. Mm. Because uh, otherwise you, you achieve nothing. So how do you think that has played into what you're doing right now because right now as you know we're, we're kind of both of us and many of us in our age group we're at the uh, less attractive end of the employee spectrum and so you really do have to come back to that what am i going to do how am i going to earn an income how can i do that well i found that when i came here because um, the background to my coming here was was uh, um, Many people consider it fairly romantic, but I did arrive here with no um, no benefits other than medical. With that, you pay for with your very expensive immigration. Um, but so, and I have a very small, very very small pension and very little capital. So I had to supplement that. So I've started this venture um, because you can't find anything. Mm. People won't give you the time of day. They, 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 they look at your date of birth and they say, not interested. Mm. So at the age of 72, I'm forging ahead and, and, and trying to build something that will give me some supplementary income. Um, and I'm doing two things that I really, really enjoy doing. Using my hands, do it yourself, fix, innovate, and um, proofreading and editing. I like writing. I'm not a very good storyteller. I'm not a great storyteller. But, I you, can, but you can craft words together and you know how yes, they function. And, and I, can, I can help other people. I can find the areas where a lot of my own writing, uh, my wife often finds, she says, you left an E out or you misspelled that word or you, you know, and, and I, oh, because when you read it yourself, you see what you wanted to say. Yes. And, and it's like reciting it, yes. isn't it, in a way? You're not yes. reading it, you're reciting it. Yes. So you do need somebody else to look at it, to look at the quality of what you've done and so forth. I do like writing stories. I do like writing accounts of things. But I'm better at, at recounting events than telling a story. Mm. And some people can combine the two. They can recount events in a storyteller's way. Mm. And that is truly brilliant. Mm. That is so so good mm. i'm waiting for this one chap to say to me he wants to put his writings into a book because he's promised me that i will get the the, the editing well, that's exciting <laughs> but so you know, where do you do your fixing and you've brought an array of items and uh and we've got bits and pieces that that you could tell us about well, i particularly like the what you've done with your leather belt because uh you know leather is a valuable item really there's a lot of cost uh, embedded value yeah. and cost in a leather belt isn't there uh, and there's the, the perception of quality leather being yes. associated with quality so tell me about the belt this is a belt that i bought in the late 70s mm -hmm. in rhodesia and uh, it has seen some pretty good service and one day the buckle end just gave up so i repaired it and um, stitched it myself by hand. Did you use that? Uh, to no, it? no, no, that's just a that's just a okay. curiosity. That that's a, a sailmaker's palm. Okay. But no, I, I I normally use an awl 
uh, mm -hmm. to make the holes and then I, then I stitch it. I use a single thread, a lot of people use a double thread. Mm -hmm. I find double thread awkward. But now I never use it and I actually put it on the floor, put my foot on one end and when I've sharpened knives, I strop them on this old belt. Okay, so what does that do to the knife when you, well, when you often, strop a knife? Often when you, when, you, when you sharpen a knife, the edge of, of the knife tends to feather slightly ah, yes. and it gets a very slight burr on it. Yes. So what the stropping does is it, it just gets that burr off without um, taking the edge off ah. the knife. It, it's often not necessary, Yeah. especially with the different types of, of sharpening gear. I find that a lot of the, I meant to bring one with, but a lot of people have got a little knife sharpener in their, in their drawer, in their kitchen drawers, and uh, it has a, a thing and you draw the knife through yes. it. What tends to happen with the metallic ones is that they, they start to chew up the metal and you start getting little jags yes. in, the, in the cutting edge. What I try to do the way I sharpen them is to get those jags out and get a smooth cutting edge because otherwise you start to tear it at things mm. and there's nothing mm. worse than trying to cut a piece of steak and it, and, and it, and it tears across the grain. Tell me what it's like to to be an older person starting your own business? Because you've, you have, you've come here and you've had to start from scratch again. What's that like? In a way, it's quite scary and it's a bit worrying. But I, as I compared it once before, you may remember, I said, in South Africa, my perception of how life was going to be was looking inward. But since I've been here, there's a different approach, a different, um, uh, how can I put it, a, a, a different understanding of getting things fixed, of, of who does what. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no sort of, um, there's no distinction between the person who, who effectively, there's no, no distinction between the person who um, does the carpentry, mm. the person who collects the garbage, and the person who works in the shop, and the person who works in an office. Everybody works. Yes. And so there's a, there's a different uh, perception of, of where you, you're, you're just a person who fixes things. Mm. You're not a person down there who fixes things, you're not a person up there who fixes things. Yeah, that's just and what so, you do. Yes, that's what you yeah. do. And, and there's a, a more respectful appreciation of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's very hard to explain. Yes. And I'm, I'm not even sure that I'm doing that very well. Yes. Um, How does it, it make is, you feel, though, that, that well, you've had to do... I, I think that, again, to use a hackneyed expression, I think that what I'm doing here and now, I'm seeing a light in the tunnel and it's not a train coming towards me. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the light as I approach the, yeah. the, the end of the tunnel. So um, it, it's a bit scary at times and it comes in fits and starts. Yes. Sometimes I'll have three or four things to fix for people, but I would like it to be a more steady work. Are people happy to pay to have good. things fixed? Because we are, you know, I said before that it's easy to throw things away and pay for something new. Well, Generally, do we like to pay for things to be fixed? It's, some people have a, an understanding of if this thing has value, if it's going to cost me X amount to fix, I'm prepared to pay so much percentage, mm. uh, rather so much to buy a new one, I'm prepared to pay a percentage of that. And often the newer stuff doesn't have the quality of the older stuff. Mm. So uh, a lot of people don't appreciate that. Take the toaster thing, I fixed a few toasters, and people say, oh, I can just buy another one. It's only gonna cost me $35. And I say, well, I can fix it for you for $15, mm. you know, or $20 or whatever. Mm. Um, save you half the price. Um, and uh, there was a woman brought me a Hoover vacuum cleaner and she said it doesn't switch on. So in order to see the problem, I had to do work. I had to dismantle this thing, find the problem, which was a switch, find another, a, a, a replacement switch so I wouldn't know what it was gonna cost. And I thought, I'm not gonna go back from Marucci door to send this person an email and say, it's gonna cost you so much. So 
I phoned her up and I said, I have fixed your vacuum. It was a good quality vacuum um, and $45. And she went off. No oh. ways. I could buy a new one for that. And I thought, no, you can't. You, can't. you don't yeah. want to get into an argument. No. So I thought, no, you can't. So I said, well, I don't think so. And that's a very good machine that you brought me. Mm. And only that thing that was wrong with it. And it required some skill, some knowledge, mm. and some running around to fix it. Mm. The actual part was really not particularly expensive. Um, and in the, in the end, I accepted her proposition because I thought, I'm not going to get into this. She mm. said, I'll give you a nice homegrown pumpkin and $35. <laughs> So that's what I settled for. Okay. But then there was the chap who, who, who brought me something to fix and, and uh, I fixed it. It was a relatively simple fix and I went around to see him and I said, ah, oh, you know, it was so easy. I normally have a minimum charge around X, Y or Z, but give me $10 and we'll call it that. Well, he went on and on and on about, eventually I got $5. He still owes me $5. Really? Uh, and. That's the appalling. house, the house that this chap lives in, is it's a palace. Yes. And I thought, yeah. really? Yeah. You know, it's quite a skewed perspective, yeah. isn't yeah. it? And, and I thought, well, maybe that's why he's got the money to live in a palace. Yeah. Well, and that's true. Yeah, so I don't true. want to be nasty, but no, I know, I know, but but it is that mindset, isn't it, that mm. we do, and maybe we're distrustful of something that has broken. Mm. That how long a life will it have? And and I have had. That experience with computers, for instance, and and you know you upgrade and you upgrade and you upgrade, and uh, and some things really just do have a limited life because there there is that inbuilt mm. obsolescence. Yes. Um, so you have to have some understanding Balance. of what is worth fixing, mm. and and what isn't. And I I mean we always prefer to buy something more expensive so that it is quality. worth fixing. Mm. Uh, because that's we we tend to fix mm. as well. A chap brought me a, a food mixer similar to that one, mm. and uh, they had been making soup and they'd been bones, chicken bones. Ah oh, yes. And the thing had jammed, and they'd kept trying, <laughs> and eventually, eventually the little arbor, the little nylon arbor, yes. had just been rounded. So now, yes. if you held it like that, it rotated. As soon as you put it into a bowl of yeah. even water, yeah, it, it wouldn't rotate. Mm. So I actually built an insert wow. because the agent said, oh no, you've got to buy a complete the shaft, part, yeah, uh, which is going to cost $100. And they'd only paid 140 for the, for yeah. the it was a good quality thing. Yeah. So I said, oh, I'll see what I can do. So I, I bought some epoxy and yes. I made an insert. Yeah. I went and I took it back to him and I showed him. I said, you have to put it in correctly. Yes. If you don't, it won't work. Okay. But it should be okay. Yes. And if it fails, let me know and I'll have another go at it for you mm. for nothing. Well, so far he hasn't come back to me. That's so good. once a certain amount of time has passed, I'll say, no, I'm sorry, I'm not prepared to now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. things are, there are so many things that can be fixed. Yes. Um, but people, maybe it's that distrust thing. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. But no. I'm, I'm just, I'm just loath to throw things away. Yeah, um, I am too. Uh, because why? Especially if you've bought something that's of a decent quality, you've had it for a while, and it has no obsolescence. It's not so high tech mm. that it has been superseded. Mm. Not unlike a computer or something, it, it, it doesn't become superseded. Mm. Tell me about how you felt uh, after you, you've had several redundancies, which is part of life these days, uh, and I've had my own. How did you, how did you move through that period, and how long did it take for you to pick yourself up and and move on? I think the first time was the hardest because I, I felt hurt, insulted, uh, demeaned useless, couldn't work out what I had done wrong. And no matter how many people told me, you haven't done anything wrong, it's not your fault, mm. you still feel that you've been made worthless. So it's hard and you, you, you find it difficult to get out of bed in the morning and you, you, you just feel dejected and a bit depressed. Mm. 
But once you find something to do and you get into a routine of doing things, and my first, if my first attempt at my own business, uh, I think I was just shifting, <coughs> just turning money around. But at least it gave me a sense of purpose. Mm. I then became um, fully employed. One of the jobs I had was uh, actually as a proofreader, which is where I got into doing that. And then I had a couple of very, very good jobs. And then again, I took a voluntary um, redundancy. And even after volu voluntarily taking that redundancy, I still felt that something, I feel, still felt sort of not right about it. Mm. But I had a plan and I went and did things. And one day I was sitting at home and I was thinking, what am I going to do now? You know, getting really worried about 18 months had gone by and I'd been doing a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of this and a bit of that. And um, the phone rang well before cell phones. <laughs> Picked up the phone and a chap named Hedley Boyd Moss, ex uh, BSA police, the Rhodesian police force. And he had a small business uh, doing antennas and, and associated equipment for high sites. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said to me, what are you doing? So I said, well, I'm looking for work, but I'm doing a handyman work and fixing things and that. He said, you'd like to come and see me? I'd like you to work for me. That made me feel really yeah, good. Yeah, fabulous. I went and worked for Headley for about three years. Um, he was very good to me. Uh, he gave me a fair bit of autonomy. It was one of the few times that I, I, I felt I had purpose mm. um, after the army, mm. because I, I, I still, if I was an employee somewhere, I would still feel odd. I would still feel like a square peg in a round hole. But he didn't make me feel that way. He was very, very good. He, he taught me things and he listened when I had things to say. Mm. And, and, and he, he, he wasn't afraid to come up to, if you came up with some sort of innovation, he wasn't, he wasn't afraid to, to bring it in or he would give you a reason why it ain't gonna work. Yeah. Which he was a great guy to work for. And then, uh, some chaps that I'd worked for previously, the bloke had been, he, he actually li lives in West Australia. He works for one of the big telecoms company. And Bruce phoned me up one day and said, um, you can come and have a sandwich with me. He said, I'd like you to come and work for me. That, him, him and our technical director from this other company where I'd taken voluntary retrenchment, mm. um, they'd started a business. And I went and worked for them for, hmm, must have been four or five years. And um, Bruce came back to Australia and the company was struggling a bit. And then the first company I'd worked for, the first one that made me redundant, they asked me to come and work for them. Mm. And I worked there for 11 and a half years. So it's really about who you know in those sort of circumstances. In some, isn't instances, it? <laughs> in some instances, yes. Yeah. And then I did work for one or two people who were not the nicest of people. Sure. So do you think it, you know, when, and I've had the experience myself, as I said, but it is in that finding that purpose again, mm, that reason yes. for getting out of bed yes. in the morning yes. that keeps you going, isn't yeah. it? And, and I, even now I have my, my yep. uh, ups and downs. Peaks and troughs. Yeah, sure. You know, and, and, and sometimes I just feel a bit down and a bit out of it. Yeah. And then I have to sort of say, well, look, you've got these things to do. Yep. Stop putting them off. Just do them. Do them. Don't yeah. worry about what you think other people might think. Yeah. Don't worry about other people's opinions. Yeah. If, if this suits you. Yeah. And the strangest thing about this is I have a stepson who's now my best friend. He's in his late 50s. And um, and David and I, we really are very, very close in, in many respects. When he was called up to do his national service uh, in the late 70s, I wrote to him every day. Mm. And all I wrote to him was, do your best. Don't be influenced by your peer group pressure about, oh, never volunteer and all that kind of thing. If you think that that activity suits you and it interests you and you will be able to do it well, go and give it your best shot. Mm. Doesn't matter if you fail, mm. as long as you've given it your best shot. And do you know why I did that? Mm. I never had anybody to do that for me. Yeah. And never, and, and, and it was, it was, I just felt it was so important yes. for him. And, and I'd been a regular soldier by that stage for 15 years. And, and, I, and I, every day, even if I couldn't post the letter, I would write a couple of paragraphs. As soon as I got an opportunity, I'd post it to him. Then almost every day, I sent him a letter That's while he was doing his training. Yes. And uh, he appreciated it. He really did. But, but I, I believe in that. I believe that you can't spoil people. 
but you need to, there needs to be a degree of, it's a bit like training a dog. People are the same. Yes. You, you, you have to be consistent. Yes. People have to know the, the boundaries, the parameters. Yes. And, and people will, will, will surprise you mm. about how, um, how much effort they'll put in. And you don't have to pay them a vast amount. You can say thank you. Yes. You can say well done. Mm. And, mm. and, and, and that goes good. such a long way mm. to feeling appreciated, feeling mm. that, that I'm a member of this team, I belong. Mm. Uh, the, and at the, the end of the day, that's pretty much yeah. what we all want, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, we want to belong yeah. to something. So you're feeling that you belong to the Palmwoods community? Um, I, I, I'm, yes, to a large extent. It's, mm. it's early days. I've only been here for two years in November, well, two years in July, but I went back to South Africa for a couple of months. Mm. I came mm. back in the November. Mm. So, yeah, I've been here for so two years. So you're getting, getting a bit days. of a presence though, aren't you? The, I see you around and about and that's a good thing. Yeah, the, peop the people um, who are involved with Palmwoods Hall mm -hmm. um, have been very good to me, very kind to me and, 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 and very helpful. And, and yeah, sure, it suited them that, that I will do certain things, but but in other respects, they've they've helped me to promote what I want to do. That's good. Um, and we can find you down at the lane as well, can't yes, we? Yes, yeah. yes. That was uh, Dave Jarrett and and Sarah decided that uh, to ask me if I would like to do that as well as do the hall. Mm. And um, yes, it, it's it's nice because there are more people, mm. more people moving around. You don't necessarily get much more business, but um, it's more high visibility you're more sort of in the public eye people yep. do come and talk to me more yep. so um, I'll stay with that for you know for the foreseeable excellent um, I would like my, my proofing and editing to, to to take off more yeah. to become um, more important as an income earner of course um, because um, and you've got some fantastic little things that you put on your face book page around um, uh, the the dog screaming out of the window and of course it's called an indicator, not called a indicator, yes, yes. things like that. Yeah. It's incredible, isn't those it? Those little things. And they're, they're, they're all, funny. They're, they're all just those little things, like the it one about the poster that says, um, do something annually. Yes. <laughs> <I know. laughs> that poster must have cost a few shillings to yes, do. Yes, it would have done. Um, all right, Eric, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Uh, you can go and find Eric down at the lane Yes. Mm -hmm. On a uh, Thursday. On a Thursday. Uh, at and the hall. At the hall on a Wednesday. On a Wednesday in morning. Palmwoods, of course. Mornings. Yeah, in the mornings. And on Facebook. And yes, Eric Reddy on Facebook. Mm. And by my own name, I have my own page as well. Fantastic. Uh, we're going to obviously have this on YouTube now. And we would love you, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And, uh, and also share Eric's story because I think that in uh, part of that building our community and welcoming people to our community, uh, it's important that we let everyone know what other people are up to, particularly when they provide a really good service like mm -hmm. Eric does with proofreading and fixing things. Uh, thank you for watching and I will see you next week. Sid. If you translate them literally, it would be back to front. Okay. Yeah. Um, the dog here is coming as opposed to the dog is coming. Yeah, like you know. Yoda in Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Star Wars. Almost, almost <laughs> like Yoda speak. So um, you, you get this because their language is is more technical in some ways. Mm -hmm.